Last night, I watched my daughter sleeping, smelling of soap and tangle-free shampoo. And suddenly, the responsibility of preparing that little human being for the world was overwhelming. I'm 36 and single, and I'm strong. That's why I'm here. If you're searching for something to believe in, for your children to believe in, our hearts, our minds, and our doors are always open. The people of the United Methodist Church. Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. We are very pleased that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. This morning you'll enjoy the music of our chancel choir, including a soloist from the choir. Dr. Wayne Day, our senior minister, is preaching. His sermon is entitled, Today is Tomorrow. We have the sacrament of baptism that will be a part of the first service, and also one of our sixth grade confirmants, David Young will be confirmed today because he and his family were out of town a month ago when over 50 of our sixth graders were confirmed. During the summer, one of the great chances that all of us have is to support children going to camp. Now my children and many of our children are able to do that because our families have those resources. But not every child in the city does. And so through the First Methodist Mission, we offer opportunities for children throughout the city, in Diamond Hill, in Ripley Arnold, throughout the city to go to camp. And we ask you to help. For $100, you can sponsor a child going to one of a number of camps this summer. Think of that experience. If you'd like to be a part of that, we encourage you to call the mission and visit with Sandy Smith or Nancy Tully. And next week on June 9th, Mrs. Jean Scott, our Director of Senior Adult Ministries, is about to retire. We're going to have a reception for her in Wesley Hall at 1215, and we invite you to come and be a part of that, to greet Jean and let her know how much you've always appreciated her. If you can't be here next week, why don't you call in, leave Jean a message or send her a note, and let her know how much her ministry has meant to you and to all of us. Jean is one of the many, many incredible people who make up this church, and you are too. And so it is our prayer that the next 60 minutes will be an important part of your day and of your life. From our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you also. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom. Let us pray together. Lord, make us instruments of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. The first lesson this morning is from 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 16 through 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and has given us in the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we, re we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to, to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Life itself is a miracle. It comes to us as a gift. Every family here has known the extraordinary joy of the gift of life in our midst. Today we celebrate not only the gift of life, but the gift of love from the maker and creator of the universe. The love for Claire Marie, by God, forever and ever, as we celebrate the sacrament of holy baptism.
Beloved of God, baptism is a sign of God's mercy and love, reminding us that we do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we do, but rather on the basis of God's acceptance and gracious invitation to us. Children have always had an important place among the people of God. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to as such as these belongs the kingdom of God. Catherine and Robert, as you present Claire Marie for the sacrament of holy baptism, do you confess your own faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Do you promise to raise her in a Christian home and see that when she's old enough, she has the opportunity to take the vows for herself? As her parents, it's your privilege to give her her Christian name. What name shall be given this child? Claire Marie, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. To the people of God, we present the newest member of the family of God, Claire Marie. Friends of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care this beautiful child whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor to live so that she may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ, that Claire and Marie, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Oh God, we pray that Claire Marie, as she grows in years, may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that by the restraining and renewing influence of your Holy Spirit, she may ever be a true child of thine. We ask that you would guide and uphold Robert and Catherine and all family and friends, that by our loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, we may lead her into a life of faith and whose strength is righteousness. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalter reading for this morning is taken from Psalm 46. Let us prepare for this responsive reading as we sing together from On Eagle's Wings. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. God is in the midst of the city which shall not be moved. God will help it at the dawn of the day. The Lord of hosts is with us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true Church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new. 
who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Oh God, we come to you this morning stripped of titles, degrees, and status. We come to tell you how it is and to listen. One day our lives look good. So many of our dreams have come to fruition. Our relationships are healthy. Problems are manageable. Challenges are purposeful. And so we say thanks. Another day, life presents us with circumstances that we are unable to control. Our intellect is insufficient. Our articulation is mere babble. Our resources are inadequate and our insights are blurred. Yet, it is in these moments that we are reminded that we are dependent on you and you alone. We thank you for loving families and forgiving friends, for promises of newness in our lives. We thank you for nourishment and shelter and for the community of Christians in which we worship. We lift up those whose bodies have been ravished by disease and those whose lives have been shattered by war and terror. And we pray that your power, love, and healing may surround each of them. And now we pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. gospel lesson for this morning is a reading from the fourth chapter of Mark. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. We're excited this morning that Pam and Richard Young present their son, David Townsend, for the act of confirmation. David has been through the year-long confirmation class with Rick Wisenhunt and other leaders in the church. He was baptized as an infant, and he comes now to take the traditional vows of the church as he becomes baptized, confirmed adult member of First Methodist Church, the Church Universal, and of First Methodist Fort Worth. 
David, I ask you the historic questions of the Christian faith. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God? I do. Do you believe in the Bible as the revealed Word of God? I do. And do you promise to lead a Christian life? Yes. Please kneel. David Townsend Young, remember your baptism. May the Lord defend you with his heavenly grace and by his spirit confirm you in, into the full fellowship of all true Christians of Jesus Christ. O oh God, we ask that you would bless David. Let your spirit be with him, guide him, protect him, lead him. Let him know your love all the days of his life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Congregation, please rise. We will welcome together the newest member of our congregation. We rejoice to recognize you as a member of Christ's church and bid you welcome to this congregation of the United Methodist Church. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. With God's help, we will sorter our lives after the example of Christ that, surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. David, as you become a part of the First Methodist family, I ask you the question we ask all who are a part of the church universal, whether it's Roman Catholic or Baptist or Presbyterian, but as you come to be a part of this family, will you be loyal to the Methodist Church and uphold it with your prayers, presence, gifts, and service? I will. We welcome you into the church, and we look forward to serving God with you. Let's give him a hand. Please be seated, and we do welcome all of you to First United Methodist Church, those of you here in the sanctuary and those who worship with us through television. We ask you to register your attendance, and we invite any of you who would wish to become a member of our church, if you would fill out the Today card that you find in front of you, then we invite you to bring it forward as we sing our closing hymn so that we can greet you at the communion rail and introduce you to the congregation. Now that Dr. Day is back and he's had a moment to catch his breath for a moment, I want to invite him to come forward to tell you about an important recognition and honor that one of our church staff members will experience on Tuesday evening. In the Methodist Church, we have two orders of ordination. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, but some are set aside as elders to administer the sacraments, to maintain the order and to preach the word. The stoles that you see worn by Dr. Henry and Dr. Marshall and this gentleman over here, what is his name? Dr. Connor, that's right. <laughs> Dr. Connor, he's our shy one. These are the elders of the church, Dr. Longsworth, etc., set aside to preach the word, to administer the sacraments, and to maintain the order of the church. We have a second order for those in specialized ministry, the order of deacon. These are usually youth ministers, music ministers, ministers of administration, children's ministers, etc. On Tuesday night of this week, Dr. Jim Terry will be ordained a deacon in the United Methodist Church. He is one of the key business administrators in our congregation, and it's wonderful to know that with his training and his background, is present in our business office. And let me tell you, those people need all the religion they can get over there. We welcome Jim Terry as a deacon in the church, and let's give him a hand. As is usually the case, the announcement is filled with great opportunities for you, from a concert Thursday night to all sorts of activities. What I want to do very briefly is try to describe, I think, the essence of the church falls into outreach and relationships. In terms of outreach, I encourage you to be aware of the fact that our youth are selling shares this morning for their mission trips. Uh, if you can support them, it will make a difference, not just for them, but for others. 
And then I also want to invite you to consider, uh, to consider sponsoring a child in our community for the opportunity to go to camp this summer. You see the information in the bulletin in the paragraph describing summer camperships. This comes through the First Methodist Mission, through Sandy Smith and Nancy Tully and all the volunteers there. For $100, a child in our community is able to go to one of a series of camps this summer. And that experience that that child will have will probably go far beyond our ability to understand or articulate that. So if you are able to be a part of that, know that you will make a tremendous difference. And relationships mean so much to us. One of the dear, dear people in our congregation is here this morning. She's worshiping with her husband, Bill. Jean Scott is uh, in the back to my right, to your left. We're about to do the Jean Scott wave right now. Jean's retiring. And next Sunday, at 1215, we will formally honor her at a reception in Wesley Hall. If you can be here, I invite you to come and be a part of that. Now, that's the formal reception. There will be all sorts of odd informal receptions and harassment that will begin now and go on indefinitely, Jean. But next Sunday at 1215, please do come and let Jean know how much you feel about her and how you appreciate her ministry. Now let's stand together as we raise our voices to God. Words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In spite of the fact that we try to read on Sunday morning those passages which most clearly and most succinctly state the faith, if you've looked at the Bible very much, if you've had some experience in reading it, you'll know that the Bible is a difficult book. It's a kind of an odd book. It's got a lot of parts of it that are just difficult to under, understand, difficult to comprehend. It's, a, it's an old book. In many ways, it's a difficult book. But in spite of all of that, have you noticed that when people are in trouble, where do they turn? They turn to this book. They turn to the Bible. You go in a hospital, it's not uncommon to see there on the bedside someone has brought a Bible. 
It may be that they haven't read it very much, but when they come into the hospital, suddenly they get interested again. I've had a federal judge in, in Houston, Woodrow Seals, was well known for the fact that he was the one who got all the ministers together in 1960 for John Kennedy to speak, and therefore Woodrow Seals, the federal judge, played a great role in getting him elected. Woodrow Seals was a great Methodist layman, and he used to say, if I were marooned on an island, there's only one book I would want to take with me, and that is the Bible, which could give me real life. Prisoners of war in Vietnam didn't want to recall Shakespeare. That's not the book they tried to recall. But soft what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. That would do nothing for them. They didn't try to remember the classics like Chaucer, Juan Thonaprilli with the Sori Sote. The Droth of March has pierced to the Rote. They didn't want Bard or Tillich or, or Niebuhr. What they wanted was the Bible. All things work for good for those who love God. And they tried to remember every bit of it. Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death. And the beginning was the light. And he is the light of the world. Isn't it, isn't it strange, as difficult as this book is, that whenever we're in trouble, it's the place we turn. Because it ha offers some hope. It offers some meaning. It offers some purpose. It offers a way forward, and it offers the truth. Jesus was talking to his disciples about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a seed. Your life, the church, you're, you are much like a seed. Planted, planted deep in faith, can make an extraordinary difference. I uh, go to the gym two or three times a week. It's just something that I started a few years ago. I really go because of, uh, well, it gives you stamina, you can sleep better, and sort of as a side benefit, you can eat more. <laughs> One day while I was at, the, at the, the gym, the man next to me happened to be an MD, and he was asking me about what I was doing and why I was doing it. And I explained my reasons, and he said, well, those are good reasons, but the best reason is what it's going to do for you in your old age. My father liked to save money. Unfortunately, he never passed it on to me or my kids. I guess it's not genetic. He loved to save money. When he got his first money as a child, he saved it. And he's, and when he, so when he got married, he bought a diamond ring, not by borrowing the money or using it from his parents, but by money that he saved. He was just good. That's the way he was. He was a saver. When he had his first job, he put, it is hard to believe in today's world, but he put 50% aside and lived on the other half. And our whole family benefited. We still continue to benefit from the seeds that he planted that grew made opportunities. My great-grandmother was a woman by the name of Emma Foster. She was born before 1900, lived into her 80s. She founded a little church in the Central Texas Conference between Cross Plains and Rising Star, the first Methodist church of Pioneer, Texas. Pioneer doesn't exist anymore. She lived on a farm all of her life. She had two daughters, Myrtle and Alta, and seven grandchildren, and Emma saw that every one of her seven grandchildren went to a small church-related private school. Investing. Investing. She knew the truth. You, what you do comes back to you. What you do today, create tomorrow. I'm so glad she planted that seed. I'm so glad it was so important to her to make sure that those descendants had not only an education, but the right kind of education. It's, think of those people that founded this church. It's really kind of extraordinary when we think of our ancestors and, and, and what they did. It was absolutely, absolutely, truly, truly amazing. Truly amazing. This building was built in the late 1920s. The budget of this church was less than $50,000. They built this building for a million dollars. That's 20 times budget. That means if we built a building today for 20 times budget, it would be $60 million. The cost 
of Bass Hall. You want to talk about faith? Do you know, do you know why we have what we have and who we are? Because somebody planted a seed and planted it deep and had great faith. They knew what they do tomorrow. What they do today creates tomorrow. What you do comes back to you. Extraordinary people, extraordinary faith. There's no reason why in a town of 500,000 we should have the third or fourth largest Methodist church in the nation. There's no reason for it at all. It's unlikely. It's unpredictable. Larger than, it, and, and than Atlanta or, or New York or Cincinnati or Los Angeles or Seattle or you just name it. Why? 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 What you do comes back to you. What you do today creates tomorrow. And Jesus said, and he's saying it to you today. Plant the seed. We have uh, in the balcony today, we have the salutatorian. What's the name of that high school over there? Pascal? The salutatorian of Pascal High School. Last year we had also the valedictorian. Do you, do you know how those things happen? Do you know how those things happen? People plant a seed that grows into a great tree. People plant a seed that grows into something truly wonderful and, and truly important. Now, you and I are happy when we go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, it's just a little spot and it's not cancer, and that makes us happy. And we're happy when this, whoever's managing your investments or whatever you have, when somebody says, well, you made 5% this year or 10% or... 15% you made more and that makes us happy. It makes us happy when we're at work and we set goals and we succeed at work. That makes us happy. But Jesus says it's nothing like, it's nothing like the magnificence and the fulfillment that comes from helping others, from loving others, investing Sure, it's fine to invest in you. Wonderful. Everybody should do it. Sure, it's great. It, it, it's fabulous. But think of the joy you, you get from investing in your children. Think of the joy you get from, from, from investing in the next generation. Think of the joy you inve get investing in others. Marty and I were in Washington, D.C. two weekends ago to see our daughter walk across the stage and get uh, a law degree with honors. And it was a high, high moment, higher than... Uh, higher moment for me than any job I've ever had, any paycheck I've ever gotten. And you can go on and on. But what's, what's even higher than that is, as a lawyer, she chose to take a low-paying job to help poor people, public defender in Washington. But, but what's even more amazing than that, one of her professors came up to Marty and to me afterward, and this was a well-known professor, who's written lots of books and made lots of money, and this professor said, you are so lucky to my daughter, Joanna. I had that job for 12 years, and it was the greatest job that I ever had. The greatest job that I ever had. Now, her mother and I are horrified that she's going to be running around with liars, cheats, and thieves. Somehow, she got a little confused. You're really not... It's nice to come and listen on Sunday morning, but you're not supposed to believe it, and you're not supposed to live it. It's very dangerous. Very dangerous. The Bible is kind of troubling, isn't it? It's difficult. And it's the investment in ourselves that's important, in others, in our family that's wonderful, in others it's even more important. Think about what's happened here in this church. The ancestors that invested here that created this building. And, and think about what's one of the greatest ministries of this church, the outreach ministry. Why? Because somebody had a passion, had an incredible passion for others. And Sandy started out with a car taking groceries out of the back of the car, and it's grown into this several hundred thousand dollar a year outreach ministry. Think about the youth program, uh, the youth choir, 10 or 12 kids a year ago, I mean seven years ago. 
passion, excellence, a hundred kids, magnificent music. It doesn't happen. People have to invest themselves. Invest themselves not just in what's good for me, but invest themselves in what's good for others. A little seed that grows. And I want to submit to you today that it's the investment in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ by so many people that has made such a difference in our lives. I mean, we take it, we take it for granted. We know all about the problems of the church. Everybody here has had an experience with punitive religion and, and sick religion and difficult religion and false religion. And everybody here has had experiences, as all of us have, with egocentric ministers and self-absorbed lay people and, 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 and self-absorbed staff people. I mean, that's just, that's just a part of life. It's just a part of life. We know about all the difficulties of the church. But I want to ask you one question. Where did the hospital come from? The hospital was founded by the church. And for centuries, they were the only hospitals. And even today, you go to New York City, you go to Houston, you go to Fort Worth, the best hospitals are not for profit. Goodson used to say when Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan, every hospital in America had its groundbreaking ceremony. It was founded on the principle, if you plant a seed, what the future will be like, not for me, but for others. We got a, some of you people here in this room have some casual affection for Texas A&M and the University of Texas and TCU and some other institutions, Oklahoma, and just casual. The university was founded in the 12th century by the church. At Oxford, for many years, you had to be a priest to even teach at Oxford. The university, the Methodist church has founded more colleges and universities than any Protestant church in America. University of Southern California, Vanderbilt, Northwestern, Syracuse, you go on and on. And let me tell you, it'll be an impoverished world if all we have are secular higher education as good as it is. Goodson used to say when Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, every university in America had its groundbreaking. And ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason why this country is great. Read Founding Brothers. Read the history. Read the two or three key principles in our founding fathers that have made this country what it is and so different than so much of the rest of the world and those, those principles came right out of the Christian faith. Study your history. This is not, I'm not talking about the church of Wayne Day or the church of Walter Underwood or the church of Gaston Foote. These are, I'm talking about the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Happiest people I know are those who have discovered that joy of what you do comes back to you. I'm thinking of Harriet Griffin who died in her 90s, who gave her life to public education, gave her life to senior citizens work, never made more than about $35,000 a year. What a life, what an influence. I'm thinking of Helen Watt who's done more for the foundation than, than all of the fat cats, et cetera, et cetera, just for one woman who had a passion. I'm thinking of Brooks Harrington. Gave up his law degree, went, to, went over to Diamond Hill to, in, in a place in our city that's so bad that oh, I had a friend that drove over there to, to work with him and the police stopped him and said, you don't want to be in this part of town. Get out of here. I'm thinking of Bill Power. He was a great Old Testament professor at Perkins, but not only was he a great Old Testament professor, you know where he was on Sunday? He was teaching children. Forty years as a outstanding Old Testament scholar, every Sunday he was teaching children. And when he retired, his students who got so much and the children in his church and their families raised a million dollars to establish a scholarship for him. It's an old book with some strange stories, some very strange stories, about a woman who spent all the money she had to wash the feet of Jesus. 
about a man, Nicodemus, when he realized what he had been doing to the people around him, not only gave back what he had stolen, but doubled it. Like Ruth, who was in the far country and should have gone home to be with her family, but stayed with her mother-in-law, I will go where you go. Like Paul, who spewed hate and became a man who spewed love wrote the greatest of words of love that have ever been. Jesus gathered his disciples about him. Your life is like this seed. Plant this seed in faith. One question, what is life about? What's it about? Is it about how little we can do and how little we can give of ourselves? What's life about? There's a, there's a reason why we turn to the Bible in trouble. Because the Bible has the way, the truth, and the life. What you do comes back to you. What you do today creates tomorrow.
If this is a Sunday you've decided to unite your membership with that at First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth, I would invite you to bring a Today card forward with you that we might recognize and introduce you. We hope you feel blessed by this morning's services here at First United Methodist Church. This television ministry is made possible by the vision of Richard A. Lindsay and many volunteers who helped fulfill his dream of bringing our church into your living room. We invite you to help support this television ministry in Richard's memory by joining the Richard A. Lindsay Television 100 Ministry. Please call First United Methodist with your donation. The number's there on your television screen. Area code 817-336-7277.